The following is a debrief of Essay 1 from the February 2023 California Bar Exam. If you would like access to these debriefs earlier, or if you would like access to more debriefs from past California Bars, simply go to our website, linked below, and enroll in our free service, CalBar Updates. And if you find value in what we do with these debriefs and our other work, then please do all the usual YouTube things. Subscribe, share with your friends, and comment below. Tell me if you think that you would like to see a more interactive platform. Would you like us to start a Patreon? Could we build, in essence, the major components of a bar course for very little money. For some years now, we've debriefed the essays and the performance test from the California bar each time it's administered and the bar releases the hypotheticals. Let's do that with the February 2023 bar exam, starting with question one. This is Dr. Nancy Johnson, and I'm going to debrief this one. As usual, I start with the calls. If you're sitting on a bar exam, you don't know what the subject is, and the faster you figure that out, the better, because then your mind will have your organized schema or outline of the law in mind, and it will make it easier to issue spot accurately. What do we have here? Did the court properly deny Dora Tyre's motion to dismiss? That sounds like civil procedure. On the next page, we go on to call two. Did the court properly grant Dora Tyre's motions to compel production of the statement from Wynn and then to compel a physical examination of Pam? Now, the California bar generally gives us a P name for the plaintiff and a D name for the defendant. So I'm assuming Pam is the plaintiff, Dura Tires is the defendant. These are motions to compel production. This is discovery. Did the court properly order Dura Tires to produce its scientific report? All right, so this is pure civil procedure. I don't know yet whether it's federal civil procedure or California civil procedure. I don't see an instruction to answer according to California law, but let's see what court it's in. Dura Tires manufactures and installs specially coated tires. Dura Tires advertised that a scientific report declared that its tires will not go flat for the first 7,000 miles of use if driven properly. Dura Tire's scientific report was created at the direction of its legal counsel and contained research on flat tire incidents involving Dura Tires. This all goes toward call three, the scientific report call. And the issues I see already here are that this is an expert report, that it was at the direction of legal counsel and it contained research on flat tire incidents involving Dura tires. So is this work product? Is it discoverable at all? So basically this first paragraph contains quite a bit that I'm gonna need for call three. But let's go on with a note that I need to remember that this, this may be work product. Pam purchased four new tires from Dura Tires and had them installed by Maurice, a mechanic. Pam drove 100 miles and one tire went flat, causing Pam to swerve and crash into another car. Pam was not physically injured in the accident. Pam gathered a written statement from the other driver, Wynn, who suffered a minor injury. Wynn's statement was favorable to Pam's case. Wynn's statement is called 2A. Physical injury, we have a request for a physical exam, so we'll come to that later. Pam filed and properly served a complaint in federal court against Dura Tires for breach of warranty 
and negligent installation and manufacture of the tires. The federal court had proper jurisdiction over Pam's complaint. Pam alleged that she suffered property damage and emotional distress as a result of the accident. So there we have the claims and we have the damages she's asking for. Next paragraph. Dura Tires filed a motion to dismiss for failure to join Maurice as a defendant. Maurice is the mechanic who installed the tires. So the issue here is going to be necessary and indispensable party. And that's what this paragraph goes to. Call one. The court denied Duratire's motion. Duratire's filed and properly served an answer to Pam's complaint. We need to know those complaints, the claims, in order to analyze necessary and indispensable party. Okay, go on. Pam served her initial disclosures on Dura Tires, but did not produce Wynn's statement. Wynn's statement, that's call 2A. Dura Tires filed and served motions to compel Pam to produce Wynn's statement and for Pam to submit to a physical examination. The court granted both of Dura Tire's motions. Okay, so we got 2A and 2B in this paragraph. Motion to compel Wynn's statement and a motion for Pam to submit to a physical examination. So when you get a motion to compel, a discovery motion, you have to worry about the timing. Is this the point in the case where they may file such a motion and then also, are they entitled to that kind of discovery? So for 2A and 2B, we need to deal with that. Physical exam, 2B. But we learned up above that she was not physically injured and the, the damages she's asking for are for property and emotional distress. I don't see any physical damage to her body claimed there. So I doubt that's going to work. Okay, go on. Dura Tires served its initial disclosures but did not include the advertised scientific report. That's call three. Pam met and conferred with Dura Tires. They're being kind to you with this to remind you about the timing of a motion to compel. Now we have a meet and confer we didn't see that up above when Dura Tires filed its motion. You have to meet and confer before discovery begins. Dura Tires refused to produce its scientific report. And that serves as a reminder that if you're going to have a motion to compel, you have to demonstrate to the court, you have to literally affirm to the court, that you have attempted to get this from the other side. We don't see that with Dura Tires, we do with Pam. Pam filed a motion to compel Dura Tires to produce its scientific report. The court granted Pam's motion and ordered Dura Tires to produce its scientific report. That goes to call three. So let's go at this systematically. Call one, did the court properly deny Dura Tire's motion to dismiss? Remember, that is an analysis of necessary and indispensable party. Okay, let's take a look at the law. If you've studied with us at all, you know that we organize law in terms of schemas and our online schemas unfold. That's what I'm looking at right now. It's in a software system we developed called Proponics. I'm looking at federal civil procedure. I'm going to part one in that subject and I'm going to look in joinder, joinder of parties, and I'm looking for necessary and indispensable party, which is compulsory joinder. That's what this motion is based on. Essentially, it's saying you failed to join a necessary party and we would like the court to dismiss. A necessary party is one who's subject to service of process and whose joinder will not 
destroy subject matter jurisdiction. I think that's the problem here. But let's go through the whole analysis. A necessary party must be joined only if feasible. Without the party, the court cannot provide complete relief or the necessary party would be harmed and so on. Um, now, the court cannot provide complete relief without him because one of the claims is negligent installation. So is this an indispensable party? If a necessary party cannot be joined, for example, because of subject matter jurisdiction, the court must decide whether it can continue without the party or whether it should dismiss the action because the party is truly indispensable. And so there are, five, there are four factors here that the court considers. So she must have used a mechanic who was domiciled in the same jurisdiction as she was. They don't give us that information, but I would be telling the grader that if joining Maurice would destroy subject matter jurisdiction, then the court has to consider these factors and decide whether to dismiss the whole action or whether to continue without Maurice. One of those factors is the likelihood of prejudice to anyone if the party is not joined. Another is whether prejudice can be reduced by the relief shaped. A third is whether the judgment would be adequate without the party. Notice that she does have an alternate forum. She can raise this claim in state court. So I don't think it so much matters which way you come down with your final analysis on this one as that you analyze all those factors. So back to the hypothetical. That was call one, necessary and indispensable party. And I think that's all that you needed to analyze in that call. I, the court denied the motion to dismiss. So they're asking you if the court erred. And that comes down to their balancing of those factors, given that Maurice is domiciled in the same place as our plaintiff and would destroy subject matter jurisdiction. So your answer depends on how you come down on those factors. Now, the, the rest of the calls, call two and call three, are about discovery. Call two has a motion to compel production of, of a statement made by a witness to the accident that was collected by the plaintiff. Call 2B is a motion to compel a physical examination of the plaintiff. And call 3 is about the plaintiff asking the court to compel the defendant to produce a scientific report it had generated at the request of its legal counsel. So let's look at discovery rules. So now I'm in part two of that schema and I'm going to look at the details under discovery and I see that the scope is that a party may inquire into any non-privileged matter that is relevant to any party's claim or defense and proportional to the needs of the case. And there's the big issue, work product doctrine. Work product doctrine says that generally a party may not discover documents or other tangible things prepared in anticipation of litigation or for trial by or for a party or its representative. There's a limited exception to that when the information can't be gotten by the other party and they need it. Okay, that's work product. What about automatic disclosure? There are three kinds of automatically required disclosures. The first is the initial disclosures and that's what we're dealing with here. They have to be made before the party can engage in other discovery and they have to include the name and address and phone number of any person the party may use to support its claim or defense 
and a copy or description of all documents, tangibles, shared information in the party's custody or control that are relevant to the party's claims or defenses. Those are the general rules that we're working under for discovery. So now, what else do we need to think about? We need to think about what happens when we file a motion to compel. When can we do that and what's involved? Well, I'm going to find that detail under Discovery Tools, so let's go there. And I see that obtaining discovery from a party, which is what we're trying to do here, and a request to produce, and a motion to compel, and a protective order. Those are the topics I want to think about. Here we have detail about physical or mental exams. When can you get a physical exam? A court can order a party whose physical or mental condition is in controversy to submit to a physical or mental exam by a suitable licensed examiner. So it seems to me the answer to the physical exam part of that call is simple. She did not put her physical condition at issue. It's not going to be available. Motions to compel and protective orders. A party can move the court for an order to compel discovery or disclosure. The party must certify that it has in good faith conferred or attempted to confer with the person failing to make discovery or disclosure. In other words, the party must have first made an effort to obtain discovery or disclosure. And that's what I mentioned. They reminded you of that in the hypothetical by some of the detail in those calls. So let's go back to that hypothetical and to the calls. Call 2A to compel production of the statement from when to B, the physical exam. We said that would be relatively easy. Her physical condition is not at issue, so the court did not properly grant that motion. Call three, ordering Dura tires to produce the scientific report. All right, let's talk about call 2A and call three in a bit more detail now that we've looked at the law. So Dura Tires filed a motion to compel production of the statement from Wynn. Now, that statement may be considered work product, and we looked at what work product was. A party collected that statement, presumably in anticipation of litigation. So you could consider it to be work product. But the other issue here is this motion to compel from Dura Tires. I said when we first looked at this that when you have a motion to compel, you have to think about the timing. Is this the appropriate time to file that motion? Is it allowed now? And second, is it subject matter that can be discovered? As to the timing, in the hypothetical, we have no evidence that they met and conferred. We have no evidence that Dura Tires requested this from the plaintiff and that she refused to provide it. So I would say that the court should not have granted the motion to compel production of the statement from Wynn and that that was in error. Not only because they had not met and conferred and asked outside of court to get that material, but also because it could be considered work product and protected. So there I remind you, timing and is it discoverable? And the issue in that call is work product as well as the timing. What about call three? Did the court properly order Dura Tires to produce its scientific report? The hypothetical told you they 
commissioned a scientific report at the direction of legal counsel. It contained research on flat tire incidents involving Dura tires. So there again, we have a huge issue of work product. That report was as a result of flat tire incidents involving the tires. It was requested by legal counsel. And so what's the standard when we're talking about work product? What's the standard for deciding whether something is in anticipation of litigation? The general rule is that a party may not discover documents or other tangible things prepared in anticipation of litigation or for trial by or for a party. But the standard is that there was a subjective belief that there was a genuine chance of litigation and that that belief was objectively reasonable. Well, if there have been multiple flat tire incidents involving those tires, then there could be an objective belief that litigation was possible. So I would submit that this is work product. But what's the problem with trying to protect it as work product? The problem is that they advertised this report. They put it out to the public that they had this report. They used the report as a mechanism to sell tires. So I would think that the work product protection had been destroyed by the fact that they advertised that report. If I were answering this, one of the first things I would want to do is give the general rule for what's discoverable. The general rule is that any non-privileged matter relevant to any party's claim or defense, including information about documents and other tangible things that, that may contain and persons who may have discoverable information, is discoverable. But discovery cannot commence before the parties meet and confer at a discovery planning conference. So that meet and confer is really important and the California Bar seems to like to push you on that point when they ask discovery questions. So all that means that this discovery request, this order to compel, was timely. But now the issue is, is the material discoverable? We said that we thought that the protection, the work product protection, had been essentially waived, destroyed, by the fact that they advertised this report. But more to the point, is this something that she could compel in initial disclosure? The rule for initial disclosure is that Dura Tires had to disclose a copy or description of all documents, tangible items, or electronically stored information in the party's custody or control that are relevant to the producing party's claims and defenses. So if they were going to use this as a defense, they were required to produce it. What's confusing here is that they don't want to when their advertising made it seem like it was a good defense tool. If they're going to use it in their defense, then the court properly ordered them to produce it in initial discovery. So look, this has gone on for quite a while, this debrief. And if you're still with me, hey, congratulations. But know that you can't write the level of detail that I've talked about in this debrief, or at least if you're as slow at writing as I am, you can't. If you got the issues I've talked about and you did a reasonable job of discussing them, then you should be fine on this hypothetical. It was a fairly straightforward federal civil procedure hypothetical. Necessary and indispensable party is not as often tested as our discovery rules. And you really have to know those discovery rules, particularly the requirement that parties meet and confer before discovery begins and that the court will not 
grant a motion to compel unless there's been an attempt to get the information from the other party first